I am Travis Carden. I'm a technical consultant uh, at Acquia, where I uh, do uh, a lot of performance and scalability kind of work for a federal government uh, client. Um, I do a little bit of stuff on Drupal.org. I have a contributed, mo uh, contributed module, and I play around in core a little bit. Um, but uh, I'm curious about you guys. Um, how many, how many of you are technical people? Almost all of you. Does anyone consider themselves non-technical? Does anyone consider themselves statistically insignificant? Okay, that's, <laughs> apparently we're all, we're all technical people here uh, then. How many people uh, consider themselves uh, developers or programmers? Wow, we have a very heavily slanted uh, audience here. Anyone that considers them more a build, themselves more a builder or a themer? Nope. Okay, a few. Great. Um, how many people have specific questions that they're interested in asking today? Okay, that tells me how much I have to hustle. <laughs> um, so, uh, what we're going to be doing here then is, um, as I said, I'm going to be trying to impart principles uh, I'm going to work on building a conceptual framework for understanding performance issues so that you can avoid problems before they arise and address them intelligently when they do. Um, I was uh, going to shoot for about a 30 minute presentation with 15 minutes for questions. Um, I'll try to kind of stay in that area even though nobody seems to have specific questions that they're ready for. I assume that some will come up. point is there will be time at the end if you have, if you have anything. Um, but don't hesitate to, to stop me if anything's unclear in the process either. Um, so my goal here is to teach you how to ask the right questions about performance and scalability. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the right question. <laughs> um, this is not the right way of thinking about the problem. In fact, it isn't thinking about the problem at all. Um, if, if you are still thinking about this space in terms of what do I need to add to my website in order to improve the performance or scalability of it, um, you're, you're, not, you're not thinking about it productively. Uh, you, you've all heard that, that song, you know, I know an old lady who swallowed a fly, and then I, she swallowed the spider to catch the fly, she swallowed the whatever to catch the spider. Um, and it gets down to the end, and at the end, of every, uh, at the end of every refrain, it's, but I don't know why she swallowed the fly. When it comes to performance and scalability, if your site is slow, you swallow the fly. <laughs> and swallowing a spider is not going to help necessarily. You're going to have to swallow a bird after that, and then you're going to have to swallow a cat. Um, you know, if you have a page on your site that's slow, and you think, oh, I found this great module that makes pages fast, then that module has a side effect. And you may have to remediate that side effect. And if you think that adding modules is the way to fix things, you're going to add another module that's going to add bootstrap load and wait to your site. It's going to be doing more. It's going to take longer. You're going to, you're going to be medicating symptoms instead of uh, root causes. We want to talk about root causes. There's, um, uh, there, there was a, a famous architect who, who once said, perfection is not achieved when there is nothing left to add. Perfection is achieved when there is nothing left to subtract. And that's kind of a good way to think about this. Um, so what is the right question that we need to be asking? It's this one. <laughs> um, this is the question that gets at the symptoms. You know, why are you slow in the first place? What is the fly that you swallowed? And once we know that, then we can, um, we can start trying to address it. So um, let's kind of build a framework for what the answer to that question could be. Um, and on this one, get your pencils out because this is going to make, make the price of the conference for you. Doing stuff <laughs> makes your website slow. <laughs> Doing stuff, also known as work. In the 90s, when every website was a brochureware website that was comprised entirely of 8K of text files on a server with uh, uh, under construction GIF, um, everything was super fast because it wasn't doing stuff. <laughs> you know, There was nothing going on under the hood. Um, but today, your website is doing all sorts of stuff. It's performing all sorts of work. And here's a formula that, uh, that conceptually can help you kind of understand what's happening with that. 
the, t the amount of time that any operation takes is going to be equal to the amount of work that that operation has to perform divided by the amount of throughput that your resources provide for you. So if you have a page request that's delivering uh, parse logs and your CPU can process 10 megabytes of data per second and you have 100 megabytes of data, that request is going to take 10 seconds. If you have somebody downloading your page on a 3G connection to their mobile phone and their connection speed is 400 kilobytes per second and you have a megabyte of images and other assets, it's going to take them 2.5 seconds to get that over the pipe. So the point of this formula is to recognize everything has a cost. Um, and it's predictable, it's understandable, but you need to recognize that fact, that there are no free lunches and there's no magic. Um, the, um, everything that your website does, all of the stuff that it does, costs you something. From the point that, you, that uh, the request for your page leaves the client's browser to the point that it gets to you and goes back to the client's browser, all of that, every step along the way, something is working to move your transaction to the next step. And the narrowest bottleneck along that pipe wins. Nothing else can go any faster. So our job in performance and scalability is identifying our constraining bottleneck. So where can bottlenecks be? Anywhere in the pipeline. Um, the whole pipeline, it's, it's helpful to remember the, the broad scope of this. I think most of the time we think about, I need to make my Drupal website faster. Well, that means that I need to tune the database, or I need to add a caching layer, or I need to uh, optimize a loop in PHP or something. But we forget that it's a really big, I mean, HTTP <laughs> protocol is the scope of our problem, right? Um, the, the problem starts on the client where they send a request. Uh, if, you're, if their request uh, is done via some kind of um, JavaScript heavy thing, you know, you're, you're already doing work on the client that's going to affect, uh, affect your latency before the, you even know that your client is doing anything. So they have to send the request. That request has to get out of their network on the red dotted line up there uh, before it even gets out to the internet where it's going to hit their internet service provider and DNS servers um, so it even knows where it's going. Then, once it gets out of the internet, it gets into your server's network, where it has to go through routing and firewalls. Um, then it gets to your server itself, where you bootstrap. Um, Linux, uh, on the kernel level, receives like the protocol requests and routes it into Apache, and Apache has to spin up a process that uses memory and CPU, and then it spins up PHP, which bootstraps Drupal and is going to hit your MySQL database. You're going to be logging to the file system. You're going to be making service calls. You're going to be calling out. You're going to be doing all these, all these things um, before you then go back out and you go back through the server and you're going to have the firewall again and you're going to have uh, ex, uh, outgo or outbound routing. Then you're going to have the client's network coming down where their network is a bigger constraint. If they're on 3G, you have to think about you're filling up their pipeline. They can't download your megabyte of images. You know, that's... That's uh, a, a bottleneck that you have to consider. They may be on Wi-Fi, maybe they're behind a corporate wa wirefall, <laughs> firewall. And the um, <laughs> point is, anything can go wrong anytime. <laughs> um, and then they have to receive and render the response. They have to build the DOM. They have to load the images. They have to execute the JavaScript. Your problem could be anywhere. If you have a customer, a stakeholder, or whatever that says to you, the website is slow, that means nothing. <laughs> um, and, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. This, this whole thing yields a couple of, uh, of insights. The first one is everything is a trade-off. Uh, this right here is um, the so-called project management triangle. Uh, and project managers uh, tell us or tell our stakeholders whenever, we want, whenever they want um, to purchase some work for us, there are three constraints on the work that we do. Speed, quality, and cost. Pick two. Your website, uh, your, your work product can be done quickly and at high quality, but it's going to cost a lot of money. Or it can cost a little money and it can be done fast, but quality is going to suffer. Um, or it can be of really high quality and of low cost, but it's going to take us a long time to do it. These three same constraints more or less apply in the realm of performance and scalability. We can think of fast as being performance, 
good as being feature rich and cheap as being low cost and maintainable. You can't have all three. You can have two of those. So, um, and this is what I mean by everything is a trade-off. If your customer wants every page load to have uh, a user-specific customized block and pieces of a dashboard and a Twitter feed being pulled in live with, um, with, with no caching or latency and they want this and that, that's, that's the good bit. That's functionally robust. That's going to pull on fast and cheap. So um, just have that in the back of your mind as you're consider, considering preventing or remediating performance problems, you're always going to be coming back to this conflict um, of delivering stakeholder value. That's what this ultimately is. You have to decide what is the value that your stakeholder cares about most because you're, you're going to rob Peter to pay Paul somewhere. Um, the second uh, insight that arises from this formula, which I alluded to before, is that you can't optimize a website because a website is not one thing that is monolithically fast or slow. It's a collection of features that are individually fast or slow. Um, if there were only one path into and through your website, you could just optimize it. But there's not one path. You have one page that's a node display. You have another page that's a view. You have another page that's actually your cron job. Um, you, you have um, all these different paths in and through. And so to say I'm going to optimize my website is really unhelpful, actually. Um, you've got to figure out what's the, what's the one bottleneck. What is the... What is the job or the unit of work that is slow? Um, and then you can, you can start talking about it. Um, uh, so how do we find out what's slow? That is, um, there are kind of, kind of two levels on which you can ask this question. The first is the intuitive level. Um, in the list of examples that I gave you before, Chrome is slow, site search is slow, the node display is slow slow, a views page is slow, we can identify those pretty easily, pretty subjectively. But if there's just kind of this underlying sense that like the whole thing is just a little bit slow no matter where I hit or whatever, then you, you probably need to do some more scientific uh, benchmarking and profiling. And uh, the tools that I list here are, are kind, of the, um, kind of the big hitters and the first go-tos for everybody. Uh, as I mentioned, my goal today is to uh, give you a conceptual framework for understanding things not to dive into how to do any particular part, because this is an enormous problem space, and I could frankly talk for five hours instead of one. Um, and I would if I tried to give you uh, a demonstration of any one of these things. So uh, re really briefly, the Bell module is going to give you tools for, uh, like it'll give you a query log uh, that you can turn on and see how long a particular page took, and it'll show you every MySQL query that was run at the bottom of the page and how long each one took. There are some other uh, profiling tools in there. The profiling module, um, and, and again, all these URLs are on the, oops, on the slides. Uh, if you want to come back later, they're hyperlinked. Um, so uh, the profiling module I haven't used in quite a, quite a while, but it seemed very interesting at the time that I was looking at it. It, it uh, kind of gives you um, a, a little bit more droopily way of getting insight into some of the, some of the other things on here. Everything uh, under that is going to be like you have to install server stuff. So if you have the ability to install server stuff, or you feel a little bit uneasy about that, start with the top two. There are other things too, but I have additional resources at the end. Um, XHProf and XDebug are profiling tools that get installed on the server and kind of run inside PHP, as it were, uh, to, to tell you, like, you spent 5% of your time in this function call, or, you know, communicating with the database was like half of the time that this request took. New Relic is a little bit similar, a um, uh, slightly different model, though. Uh, it's a it's, uh, third-party service uh, where you have a, a daemon that runs on your box, and it kind of takes, takes uh, statistics out and sends them off to, uh, uh, to a reporting dashboard that you can, you can look at. Um, so that's how you find out what's, what's slow. That's how you identify your bottlenecks. If they're not immediately obvious that a specific operation is taking a long time, those are kind of giving you some insights into it. So once you know what you're trying to make faster, how do we make it faster? Or what are the possible uh, uh, options for making it faster? In generally ascending order of cost or effort involved, the first thing you can do when doing stuff takes too long is you can do less stuff. 
you can trim scope. This is the first conflict with, uh, with business interests. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go over these high level and then have a slide for each one. Uh, the second thing that you can do is you can do stuff smarter. You can optimize. You can do stuff less often, which we call caching. You can break stuff apart and make it asynchronous, which we call decoupling. You can outsource stuff or integrate with other services that are better tuned for the specific job that's taking you a long time. Uh, you can get bigger stuff doers, which we call upsizing. Or you can get more stuff doers, which we call scaling. And I'm going to, like I said, go through, through each one of these then. So the, the first option is do less stuff, which basically means compromise or get your stakeholders to compromise. Like I said, everything has a cost. You need to make sure that your stakeholders understand that. Um, if, um, uh, like, caching is one of the big places that this comes into play. Um, your, your content owners are going to want their changes to be immediately live on the website and, and fresh. So if they go in and, and, you know, they update an embarrassing typo, they want that to be live instantly. Um, but that desire is in conflict with the desire to make your website performant because one of the biggest things you can do is cache stuff. Um, and caching stuff means we don't make changes live immediately. We make changes live every five minutes or we make changes live every hour. Um, the point of this is you have to have that conversation with your stakeholders. You have to tell them if you want a block that's going to say hello John to John when he's on the site but it's going to say hello Dave when Dave is on the site, we can't cache that block anymore. That block has to interface with the user system. It has to hit the database. There's a cost to everything that you want to do. Um, so ask some questions like, do you need dynamically generated images? You know, do, do you need to use image styles or image cache? Or can you upload a properly sized thumbnail to begin with and then save yourself doing that on the server? Uh, does, your site, uh, does the data on your site have to be live live? You know, does it have to be a, a Twitter stream that's coming down when you load the page? Or can you do every five minutes or every hour? Um, does the display have to be personalized? You know, these are just sample questions, but they're the kind of questions to ask. Um, I, I, I know I, for one, tend to fall into the rut uh, of saying, my stakeholder told me that X is slow. I assume that X is permanent and can't be changed. I have to just make X faster. But your stakeholders have to understand that making X Y is also an option. We can also do stuff smarter or optimize. Um, the point here is don't waste energy on things that you don't need done and don't do stupid stuff. With the caveat that, uh, as has been said by one famous computer scientist, um, Donald Knuth, if I remember correctly, premature optimization is the root of all evil. <laughs> um, just be aware that optimization, I told you everything's a trade-off, optimization is in conflict with maintainability. Um, People who write Perl know this. <laughs> you can get a line of Perl that is so efficient and so fast, and not a soul in the world can read it, including the guy that, that wrote it five minutes ago. Um, and and that's, what, that's what optimization does. Optimization is trading against maintainability and simplicity and often usually cost in the name of performance. So be aware of that and, and tread carefully. There are, however, some stupid things that we do that you can just jettison. So look out for things like uh, query joins, views that join too many, too many tables that, that you don't need to do. Um, uh, mind your database storage engines and indexes. You know, if you're using MySQL, make sure that you know the difference between MyISAM and InnoDB and that you're using the proper one for the proper tables. Like row level locking versus table level locking makes a big difference on insert operations. Understand those things. Um, batch your database queries. Don't do expensive stuff one by one in a, in a loop. If you've got a for each loop in your PHP and you see it writing to the database, writing to the file system, sending emails, doing any kind of call, that's a red flag. You need to look at that and ask, can I do one multiple insert to the database? I send, send emails off to a transaction server. Can I whatever um, batch stuff? Syslog instead of DB log. Your database nine times out of ten is going to be your performance bottleneck in normal situations. So don't do as much stuff with it as you know you you do when you are falling off a log, making that decision. 
Um, syslog writes your, watch, writes your watchdog using the syslog facility of the server, and it goes into files or whatever logging facility you have going on. dblog ties up your primary bottleneck of your database server. Um, if you don't have to bootstrap Drupal at all, don't. Um, that's, that's a dumb one, but it's a, it's a good one, right? Like the FAST 404 module is a great example of doing this. Um, Drupal generates expensive 404 pages because they're fully rendered, like, you know, themed things. But I, I don't know what percentage of your 404s are never rendered to a user because they're images that were missing. They're a CSS file that was, the path was cached somewhere. And so somebody's viewing a page that requests an asset that's not there, and the 404 page has to get rendered by Drupal before it gets sent off, but then nobody ever sees it. Fast 404 module checks the path for the missing asset, and it says, oh, this is an image. I don't need to bootstrap all of Drupal. I'll just send them uh, a literal string that's in my settings.php file. It's an HTML 404 not found page. Um, those are big wins if you can find them. Um, another one, compress your assets. Use gzip encoding on your HTTP uh, transfer of your HTML if your server supports that. Um, optimize your, your images. Remember that, as, as we, we talked about, bandwidth is a bottleneck. It may be that your website takes a long time to, to, to load because your server is tied down doing something expensive. It may be because you're trying to send five megabytes of stuff over the wire, and five megabytes of stuff over the wire takes a long time. You can trim, like using tools like Optiping and uh, others whose names escape me at the moment, you can trim the size of your images uh, beyond what you, you guess if you are unfamiliar with the space. Um, and then uh, another freebie is like, don't use the core statistics module ever. <laughs> there's, there's an alternative in the contrib space, but the core statistic module, basically all that it does is it writes a line to the database every time anyone makes any request for a node or, or, or another page request. You don't need to write to the database every time. That makes everything perfectly uncacheable. In Drupal 8, this has been eliminated and replaced with an AJAX-based um, uh, operation so that, your, so that your page load is not waiting on a database insert. So look for things like that. Um, next, do less stuff, cache. Um, there are so many opportunities for caching. I had to break this into three slides and still only be sampling. On the application layer, there are some freebies, like turn on course page caching and block caching if you're not doing anything that uh, renders those uh, unusable. Uh, use views and panels time-based caching, you know, in views say only update my data every hour and only update my presentation every five minutes or something. The entity cache module will uh, cache, surprisingly, entities um, <laughs> for you um, so that you don't have to hit the database every time. Like, um, and, and the boost module, I should put a red flag by because like boost module is great if you're in a very specific situation. Um, Namely, like if you're on shared hosting or you don't have the ability to add software to your server. Um, I use Boost for my personal website and it works out fantastic for me, specifically because I spend $4.99 a month on hosting. <laughs> um, and I don't need anything fancy. Uh, but basically all that Boost is, is a very, very low scale version of other really good tools that do a way better job if you can use them. So. Look at Boost if you, need, if you can't do any of the more sophisticated solutions. But these are the tunings that you can do in the application layer inside of Drupal itself, amongst others, obviously. Then there's the server layer. Um, opcode cache. Uh, when PHP is interpreted, um, I might have to speed this up a little bit. When PHP is interpreted, it gets parsed every time. It's not like Java that gets compiled once and then it's an executable on your server. Um, PHP does it every single bootstrap. An opcode cache takes the result of the parsing and stores it in memory so that you, you parse the PHP code one time and then after that it's basically an executable sitting in memory. Uh, there's also a Zen option for that. APC is more or less the defender standard in the space at the moment. PHP is going to get one built in soon, hopefully. Uh, an object cache, uh, key value pair cache, Memcached is, is kind of the dominant one right now. It sits in front of your database using a, a plug-in module that, that interacts with it and stores your queries. Um, the objects that result from your queries, it stores in memory on the server. And then you don't have to have a database anymore uh, for, for anything that's stored that way. An HTTP reverse proxy cache 
is uh, when it can be used as the holy grail of this because it just sits in front of your whole server and when a request comes in, it looks at the request and it says, have I served this, re this identical request before recently? If it, if it has, then it has a cached copy and it just throws a piece of text back over the fence basically at the client. It doesn't bootstrap Drupal. It doesn't, parse, it doesn't start PHP, which means no process is allocated to it. It doesn't even um, get into to Apache, much less Drupal it, itself. So if you can use a reverse proxy, especially, oops, <laughs> you're, you, you're, it doesn't work for authenticated traffic. Um, so if all of your users are logged in, it won't help you there. But when you can use it, like at, at, my, first, at my first job, we took the performance of our primary website using this triad of technologies here. Um, we improved our performance and scalability according to some metrics by 22,000%. <laughs> <Like, laughs> we went from the ability to serve, um, I think it was like half a page request per second to 2,000 page requests per second uh, when, when we were using Varnish because Varnish I can't talk about Varnish or I'll run out of time. So, <laughs> um, there, when I get to the uh, when I get to the additional resources at the end, I'll mention a few hosting providers that have this stuff built into them. Um, this is challenging if you're doing it yourself in house. Um, it can be done. I did it, which proves it can be done. But um, but you don't have to do it. So we'll come back to that. Um, finally, on the edge. Uh, a content delivery net, uh, network like Akamai from, um, from Amazon is basically like Varnish that sits on a huge geographically specific uh, specified server around the world somewhere that Amazon owns. And not only does it not bootstrap Drupal, it doesn't even get to your server network. Uh, we use this on, on the project that I'm on. Um, it's um, it's fantastic because our servers don't even know that they're getting traffic, really, except once every hour for one request. <laughs> so, um, Next, break stuff apart or decouple. Uh, again, this is asynchronicity or threading. Uh, don't force things to happen together that don't have to happen together. Uh, specifically, don't tie work unnecessarily to page requests. Um, do things like... If you're if you're gonna hit a web server, do that or a web service rather, do that on cron. Uh, don't don't make uh, a person who requests a web page wait for that web request to hit a, a web service to update content, pull down a feed, you know, consume RSS, whatever. Do that on cron so that your users don't have to wait for it. Um, never ever use poor man's cron <laughs> ever. Um, in Drupal 6, that was a contrib module. It came into Drupal 7 uh, core. Uh, you can just flip it off. All the core man's cron does is it says, Drupal is trying to appeal to the broadest range of potential consumers. Some of those are going to be on shared hosting and not know what a cron job actually is. So we'll add this little facility that says, hey, if the cron, uh, if cron hasn't been run in a specified number of hours, then we'll just run it the next page request that comes in that we've hit that threshold. That means that the page request that hits that threshold is painfully, painfully slow because that means I mean, the very fact that you don't have cron running on your website probably means that your website is ill-maintained to begin with. Um, and so it's probably going to be doing search engine, uh, search indexing if you're using search. It's going to be uh, checking for module updates on Drupal.org. Uh, it's going to be clearing out caches. It's going to be clearing backlog of DB log. And it's going to be doing all that while some poor user is waiting for a page to load. So don't do that. Um, get a real cron job. Um, since most of us here in the room are coders, like use the queue system. If you're writing custom modules, custom functionality that, uh, that's uh, processing intensive, uh, check out Drupal's queue system and figure out how, how you can delegate some of those responsibilities to later processing via a cron job or a drush command that you can run uh, on, on, a, on a loop. Um, and then load client-side scripts asynchronously is another example of things to do here. Um, uh, and I'm not even going to talk about that one because these are just examples and I kind of threw that one in there just to remind you that performance happens on the client side not just the server side um, uh, but remember a browser can only download so many things at one time if you can 
Oh, and the point of client-side scripts being asynchronous, if you, I'll, I'll, I'll just do what I told you I wasn't just going to do, but <laughs> like, if you put a JavaScript uh, include in the head of your HTML file, uh, a JavaScript include is a blocking request uh, because JavaScript can change the DOM, so the browser doesn't process the DOM until it has downloaded the JavaScript and parsed it because it's not safe to do so sooner. So if most of the time you're not changing the DOM, you know, you're doing Google Analytics or something like that, don't do it in a standard synchronous blocking JavaScript include. Look for things like that. Use um, Firebug or use Chrome's developer tools to get the, get the network graph and see the order in which your things are coming in. You're probably going to see a little waterfall that will surprise you. you I, I think most of us imagine like, you know, race horses like in the rings going like this, and it turns out that it's like, right, here's the HTML race horse, and then all the other race horses wait for it to get to the finish line, and then the next one goes, and the next one goes. Just be aware of it. Those tools will, will give, you, give you insight into that. Um, next, outsource stuff, or integrate with tools that are better at doing what you're trying to do, um, which in short is use the right tool for the right job. Uh, MySQL is not uh, a search <laughs> backend. MySQL is a relational database, and it's a ph phenomenal relational database. Um, but relational databases are not good at search backends. Apache Solar is a Java-based search backend that is exceptionally fast, exceptionally robust. And if, if your site search is slow and you're using core search or something, anything else that's like database backend, backend it, um, switch to Apache Solar and you will experience phenomenal results. If you don't have the infrastructure or the money to do that, going back to the conflict between business interests and, um, and, and these considerations, like maybe you can use a Google custom search or something. That's, that's another non-obvious way to make, make your problem somebody else's problem ultimately, right? Um, if you're doing document management, uh, that's also not, not a job that relational databases are as well tuned for as some tools. Alfresco is really making inroads into the Drupal community right now as a document management solution um, to kind of sit underneath of and behind Drupal. Um, so you can look into that if document management is important to you. Um, uh, another another um, opportunity for this is an alternative, alternative uh, update monitor solution. I mentioned before, like, pinging drupal.org and checking to see which one of your modules has security updates is a fairly time and resource intensive operation. And it, it happens on cron. So especially if you find out that cron is your bottleneck, then think about this. There are some other, there are some other options out there. Um, Acquia uh, has a solution that's built into their hosting for their customers. Uh, I know there are a couple of other upstart things that I've seen um, floating about recently that I don't remember the names of offhand, but it's something to look into. Uh, again, this is an obviously non-exhaustive list of things. Um, I'm, I'm kind of trying to, to get us into the mode of asking the right questions and get teasers out there that can, can help you think through these. Uh, the, next, the next one is uh, get bigger stuff doers, which we call upsizing. And this one is the easiest choice to make, uh, but it's one of the most uh, expensive at, at a point. Um, <laughs> which is why this is all I have to say about it. <laughs> um, uh, but, but there is still a balance here. Um, your time as a developer is very valuable. And um, if it will take you three weeks of man hours to optimize a site that um, your customer could pay another $50 a month to get a bigger server, like, that could be a better option for them, and it's one that they should be encouraged to think about. Um, because three weeks of man hours is a lot of money, and depending on the life cycle of their website, another 50 bucks to upgrade their hosting might not be a lot of money for them. Um, but this is subject to the law of diminishing returns and physics, <laughs> and uh, eventually you'll hit logical limits. Namely, either your, um, either your customer's budget won't support it, or uh, you'll hit the logical limits of, like, you just can't get bigger boxes. When I interviewed for the current position that I'm in at Acquia, uh, the fellow that interviewed me was, he said, let me, let me ask you a not-so-hypothetical uh, question about the project that you'll be coming on to. And then he described this big, high-traffic event uh, that they had to deal with. And he said, what would you do um, to make sure that this situation never happened again? And I said, well, 
let's start with the obvious and simple things. You can always get bigger boxes, right? And he said, actually, no, you can't. <laughs> he said, actually, we have the biggest boxes on this project that the hosting provider offers. So what's your next, <laughs> what's your next guess? <laughs> um, most, most projects are not so big and well-funded that you get to that point, but either your budget uh, or logical limits are, are going to, to hit you. Just you know, have that conversation and figure out where the tipping point is and where, where it's more cost effective. Um, the next thing is get more stuff doers. And uh, as, as I mentioned, that, that these op opportunities become increasingly complex as we go down. For most of us in the room, this is the most complex one because this involves having a server farm with load balancers and database replication and you know servers that sit out in front of your server and, and just multiple web heads and where do your logs go and how do I know which web head served which request and I got a 503 error where am I going to find the logs for it you know it's very complicated once you get to this point and there are plenty of websites out there that need to be at this point my point in saying that is don't go here until you've exhausted your other options. And that's true for all of these things. Find the one that is right for your situation. Um, whoops. Uh, so some additional resources. Drupal.org has a handbook section on performance and scalability that is uh, a, good, a good starting point for aggreg aggregated information. Uh, Drupalize.me has an excellent series. Um, was one of the first things that I consumed on this subject. Um, and incidentally, like their, their Drupal performance and scalability, uh, at the time that I got it, it was a DVD. Um, I'm sure it's just now a series on Drupalize Me. Uh, but that series will literally walk you through step by step installing a Linux server from scratch and putting on memcached, APC, varnish, solar. So if you're the in-house guy um, that uh, doesn't wear a hat because you can't choose from all of them that you have in the morning. <laughs> um, that might be a great opportunity for you. Like, take a look at that. It'll walk you through. A, I mean, it they'll it literally gives you code for like your app get, you know, package management kind of stuff to install things. So that's going to be really meaty. And if that's what you need, I, I highly recommend it. It's very good. Um, Drupal.org also has a marketplace section where you can uh, find consultants or consultancies if you need uh, if, if you need outside help on this. Um, I'm very excited about a book that came out apparently somewhat recently because I only discovered it the other day called High Performance Drupal, um, authored by uh, a number of people, one of whom uh, I know and who gave me my initial uh, my my first training on performance and scalability. Uh, and who does performance and scalability for Drupal.org, the website, not like things on it, but like the infrastructure for Drupal.org. Um, he does really good work, and I'm looking forward to reading that book. Incidentally, I saw that we all get a free O'Reilly book, right, um, for being here, and that happens to be an O'Reilly book, if I remember correctly, so, you know, check that out. Um, and then the Definitive Guide to Drupal 7 book is an excellent book in every respect, and I highly recommend you read it if you haven't read it. But it has a very good section on performance that uh, uh, that can be that can be very helpful too. Have we any questions? Yes, sir. Two things I just thought were worth noting in addition: um, performance things, particularly with on the front end, um, particularly when you're getting to small devices. Responsive images are a huge potential performance benefit. Um, and this could be a session the next block um, Scott's giving. Uh, if you've got, like, say, a header image and it's 1,200 pixels, for example, why? Because that will look great on your desktop. And you've got a 300 pixel wide, uh, you know, phone. You are downloading 16 times as much data as you should be, and that is a huge problem. Six, it's like 60 to 80 percent of the data downloaded on the web is images. So there's native solutions coming to browsers, and there's some great tools for doing responsive images, and that's a huge potential win. And then just the other thing is consolidating the number of requests that you're making to the web server. Uh, the number of, particularly with mobile devices, when you're on a cell network, latency is a huge issue because each time that a request is made to the server, there's a whole series of steps that have to be done to go back and forth between the server. 
so that if you can consolidate the number of CSS files and JS files that you have, um, that's a huge one too. Thank you. That, those are excellent points. Um, since we're recording up here, and I don't know what will hit the recording, and I don't know how well all of you are able to hear each other, uh, he mentioned that there is a session that's coming up after this on responsive images specifically, yeah. which is a great opportunity for um, boosting front-end performance, which incidentally is something I know much less about and is much less covered in here uh, in, in this talk. And he also mentioned uh, limiting the number of requests that you make, which reminds me, like aggregate your CSS and JS um, in, in Drupal core. It's just a checkbox that you turn on, and that changes from downloading what generally amounts to at least one CSS file for every module that you have installed to maybe one to five. So that's a huge one. Anyone else have any questions? Any other questions or comments? You mentioned um, CDN. It is that usually you're putting um, like files and content out there for that? Um, can you elaborate a little bit more about what kind of content you'd put out there that you would serve for your website? Sure. There, there are a couple of different things. The, the first, um, you can use it like a file server. Uh, um, Akamai, uh, which again is an Amazon product, like I mentioned. I, I think. Ak I, I think it's an Akamai product. Uh, they have something called Net Storage, and you can basically just FTP stuff up to it. And so, like, um, if if you have uh, like a JSON file that doesn't change, or you know, CSS or JavaScript or something, just put it up on Net Storage. You know, it doesn't even hit your servers. If if, it, if it's something like that that's not going to change, that's a fantastic opportunity for that because you literally just FTP it up there, and it's their problem and not yours. Um, they boast infinite scalability um, with some of their products. I think I think that's their their simple queuing system. But uh, they seem to be pretty <laughs> confident that they can hold up under stress. The other uh, the other kind of uh, paradigm is basically a reverse HTTP proxy uh, again. And and so it's just going basically what it will become is you'll point your domain name instead of at your server. You'll point it at Akamai, and then all requests for myawesomewebsite.com go there, and then it forwards them back to your server. Your server sends the request back, and, it, and, then, and then Akamai says, okay, I got this request, and the, the origin server, it's called your server, gave me this response. So I now have a key value pair, and I'm storing this. The next time somebody gives me the same request, I'm just going to send them this and not talk to origin for it. And then it's just like varnish. It's just somebody else's varnish that your server's not even running that, you know? Um, and then you just set the, the time to live TL. You say store things for one hour, store things for, um, you, you know, again, it's, it's okay with it. You can store it for a day or, or a month if, if it doesn't really matter. Um, and then just once the once a cache item has expired, um, it'll just expunge that and go back through to origin. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Awesome. Great. Um, well, I've talked I think that depends on the case. Um, it depends on what Drupal is doing to, to generate the JSON file. In Drupal 7 and before, in anything before Drupal 8, um, Drupal makes the assumption that every request is going to be an HTML page that's going to be rendered in a browser. So um, even when, it, when you have module like services module, for example, that, that does uh, web services, um, Drupal does a normal bootstrap and the whole page uh, rendering process, and then just throws it away <laughs> and sends you JSON. You have, to, you have to hack that process to get it to not send HTML, um, which is to say, if you're pre-Drupal 8, or pre-Drupal 8 from where you're sitting, um, <laughs> then um, if, you're, if your page rendering process is expensive, then yeah, caching, caching that will be of great benefit. Uh, whether, whether you can... Um, Incidentally, again, since most of us in the room here are coders, like you can create your own cache bins in Drupal. Look into the caching system on the code level, because there are all these solutions that you can just flip on with the flick of a switch. But you can build your own, too. Uh, at my first job, we had a situation where we had this enormous menu system that was in one single menu. 
Um, and we had like a revisioning uh, publication system going on, which meant that um, for every item in the menu, in order to build the menu, Drupal had to traverse hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of all of these nodes. And then it had to query multiple database tables to see if the active user had permission to see the current revision and then go back to the one that they did have. It's an enormously expensive operation to do that. So we just made a little cache bin that stored nothing but the rendered version of our big Superfish flyout menus. And it worked fantastically. It was no less expensive to create, but we optimized it not by technically optimized it, technically optimizing it. We took the approach of, you know, don't do it smarter, do it less often. <laughs> so did that, did that get out of it? I could, I could talk a lot more about that answer. Okay. It's like we still have, still have time allotted. If anyone else has any other questions, or um, I can be done, or I can tell you war stories. Or <laughs> 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 yes, tell us one, one fun war story. One fun war story. Okay. Um, so try this. The trouble with war stories is non-disclosure agreements. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So at one of my jobs, um, you know, I'll, I'll throw out two or three uh, miniature war stories because a couple of them have uh, are great examples of a cheap and easy win. Uh, we <laughs> at one of my jobs we discovered. Uh, like, our site would just go down randomly. Like, I'd get a call at, you know, 10 o'clock at night. The website's down. It's not responding. We can't even SSH into the servers. Um, and it just happened, like, with a, no apparent good reason. And after a, uh, a lot of analysis, what we discovered was that there was somebody, apparently in Kansas City, <laughs> who had installed a browser toolbar that was like an email scraper for Internet Explorer. And whenever they got online, <laughs> I don't know if our website was set to their home page or something, but whenever they opened Internet Explorer, that toolbar came on and started scraping our whole website and following every link. And, um, um, and I'm trying to remember if that was the same situation or a separate situation where we discovered that our cron script was exposed to the public. Like, if you... <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, Nobody's hungry. <laughs> um, security is something that I haven't talked about today, but if it's something you need to care about. Because what we've talked about are, oops, I made a mistake and made my website slow. Another big opportunity for slow websites is there's somebody out there that's not making mistakes. They're doing this to you on purpose. We found Joe, whoever, in Kansas City that was being unintentionally malicious to our website. But there are also hackers out there. Um, we had an exposed cron script. And it turned out that our cron was extremely expensive. And so somebody found that out and just started pinging it and then you just bring your server to your knees if you can just tell, if you can, I mean, that's called a DDoS, uh, uh, or a DOS attack, a denial of service attack, where somebody out there just sends your, your uh, server more requests than it is capable of handling so that it ultimately gets to the point that it can't even say hello to new requests anymore, and it's got such a big backlog of things that it's trying to process that you as the owner, like us, couldn't even SSH into, into our own server. So. Think about security is another takeaway there. And the, and the little freebie is if you're using Drupal 6 or, God forbid, earlier, um, <laughs> protect your cron.php. Um, block it in your HT access file. Block it in, uh, use Elijah cron to add a key to it. Block it in varnish or somewhere further out. But for goodness sakes, don't leave that exposed to the public. Um, let's see, another war story. Um, okay, so we, we had a, a, a scenario recently where we had um, a, a really, okay, so we, we had this national event or international event where 
we were expecting one hour with millions of people on our website. Um, not so much before, not so much after, but for those 60 minutes, like expect millions of people coming and submitting your forms. <laughs> and, um, and the customers wanted to have a Twitter stream on, on that page at the same time. And we knew that, uh, that they, were, they were going to be posting uh, the tweets, and they wanted them to be, uh, they were kind of using Twitter, uh, well, they were doing that integration uh, option that we talked about before. They were offloading some of our load to Twitter. <laughs> they were using that as our, as our posting mechanism so that they didn't have to, you know, add content to our database that would invalidate caches. They, they would just bring it through on the front end with an Ajax load. Uh, from, from Twitter, which is very smart. I, I commend people that, that uh, engineered that solution. Um, in order to make it work, they, uh, they needed, like there were cross-origin request constraints or something like that that was causing us headaches. And what we ended up doing was the net storage option that we talked about a few minutes ago with Akamai, JSON files that needed to be consumed by the Ajax. We just FTP'd them up to net storage out on the edge, Akamai, and, and wrote a script in, in the page, which we cached also at Akamai, so both were heavily cached and didn't hit origin, um, so that when a, when a visitor got the page, um, it didn't have any content in it itself for that Twitter feed. It went and looked for the JSON file. And the JSON file, we just uploaded whenever we wanted to add, uh, add fresh content to it. So like we completely sidestepped Drupal, and frankly, the whole, uh, the whole lamp stack all together, um, which is, which is a, a good little story because I, I, I know I, for one, tends to be a little bit myopic sometimes, and I think, all right, how can I make Drupal do this better? And Drupal isn't always the answer. Drupal is one tool in an ecosystem of tools. So I'm, I'm realizing that uh, those aren't really war stories, those are more like, uh, more like anecdotes, but war stories are, are intrinsically um, NDA unfriendly. So. <laughs> <laughs> Can't do the a company with shoulder named nameless. Right. Name nameless. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh. I like my job too much. <laughs> I, have right. one, I have one that's really maybe pretty Drupal specific. Uh, okay. I have a big website that I'm helping some big or working on, and um, it's a is a ton of content, and the spammers have found us. And uh, the one thing that makes Drupal spin all the time is the user uh, login page. And so it, it brings our site down sometimes that they're hitting it so often. And I mean, we've installed Honeypot, but that's only when we get the request in. Mm -hmm. But do you have a, a, any strategies for um, hiding that page? Or, you know, uh, another one is uh, like IP block, but that has its own mm -hmm. difficulties because then somebody is on an IP block that you're going to block and they, they can't get to your website, okay. website then. Let, let me ask a, a, a quick question before I begin to address that. Am I correct in assuming that lunch happens now and people can leave whenever, they're, whenever they feel like it? Because if that's, if that's the case, I'd like to just invite anyone who wants to go to go ahead and go at any time. And then I'm just, um, I'm going to take this opportunity to roll.